All right. Well, on behalf of Better, thank you all for coming this evening. We're really excited to have Gunter speak. Um, before we get things started, we did want to open up the floor to Sadrine from the Planning and Zoning Commission, who's heading up Plan BTV South End to say a few words about what's going to happen here in our uh, little district. Uh, I will take very much of your time, probably more, not more than five minutes, but um, thanks for the invite. It's great to just be able to spread the word a little bit about this project we're doing. How many of you are familiar with Plan TV Downtown Waterfront Master Plan we did a few years back? That was adopted, so several of you. Uh, so this is going to be a very similar process for the south end of Burlington. We're really excited. Uh, we actually... Uh, well, let me speak about the south end. We're defining our, our study area. I, I apologize if I don't have a map, but um, from, for those of you who are familiar with the area, from Maple Street all the way down south to the South Burlington boundary, and then from the lake to Shelburne Road, Shelburne Street, and Union Street, um, with a specific focus on the Pine Street corridor and what we refer to and call the enterprise area. Uh, which is where most of the industrial uses, artists, studios, you know, businesses are located. But you know, from all the way to, from here, Maple Street, all the way down to Burton. So think about it as a, a very long sort of area that we're looking at specifically. Um, so we're really excited to launch this project. Actually, um, tonight is the start of our first uh, sort of major event. Uh, unfortunately, it's same time so you can't do both and you're all here but we have food though we have like more food we don't have cider though so i might stay here uh, <laughs> so we actually launched at the art hop a few weeks back uh, that was what we call the soft launch and tonight is the start of our first three-day event which is an active living workshop with dan burnham who's a national expert on uh, active transportation and livability. Um, so we have a dinner tonight, we have two different walks tomorrow, and then we have a Saturday morning breakfast event. So I have a few flyers with me. I'm gonna leave them on the table. So as you walk out, if you're interested to take a look, feel free to do that. Um, so the process is gonna be really similar to what we did in the downtown. It's gonna be a community <coughs> conversation with resident business owners, people who work in this area, people who visit the area. Uh, about what the future of the South End should be. So it's going to be talking and thinking about transportation and urban design and public infrastructure and should we allow housing or not, uh, you know, the whole gamut. Um, so we invite you all to participate if this is something that you, um, you know, feel strongly about. We're, we just hired a team of consultants for the master planning process. It's, uh, we hired Goody Clancy out of Boston. They're a great firm, uh, and they have on their team Civic Moxie, who is uh, Susan, um, I'm forgetting her last Silverberg. name. Silverberg. thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> who uh, specializes in arts districts and keeping affordability of art spaces uh, in different um, small districts or neighborhood around you know, communities around the country. So that's definitely something that we're gonna be looking at specifically with her uh, and talking about all the other issues as well. Um, so we're developing our engagement process right now, but just please stay tuned. And the other thing I have with me is a little postcard here. Please grab one. We have, you have our URL, Facebook page, we're on Twitter as well. So stay updated on what's gonna be happening. There's gonna be a lot happening from now to the end of winter. Uh, we're going to have a lot of different events. We're going to be working with and collaborating with artists to do the engagement process. It's going to be very different. No boring meetings, we promise. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're even talking about some performing arts. We might have a show or something like the Plan TV South End show. Um, so, so stay tuned for that, and please be involved if, if this is something that you're interested in. So I think that's all I have. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. So I do have one little bit of housekeeping also. Um, just so you know, there is another exit here. Not that there's going to be a fire in the building, but 
there's two egresses, one you came in, and there is one right around the corner here. So, not that anything's going to happen, but make sure everything's safe. Oh, and it's in German. So I wanted to start by thanking our, our fellow sponsors, uh, New Moran, Cito, and Burlington Electric. Uh, the three groups really went all out getting the, the word out to all of you that this event was happening and, and celebrating uh, the fact that Gunter was going to be in Vermont and what a great opportunity it is. And I really want to thank Charlie Cooper from New Moran, who, who really gave it his all, and we really appreciate your, your efforts. I also want to thank uh, Rick Mechanic from Tagu Media. I think he's around here. He We sublet from Rick, um, and he was gracious enough to allow us to hold the event here in the South End. Oh, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about who Better is. Uh, we're a startup here in Vermont. It was the brainchild of David Benderman. He's an architect who was working over in Norway and caught the passive house bug. Mm -hmm. And when he came back to the US, he realized that there was a market opportunity to leverage the, the benefits of doing deep green retrofits and was looking at different financing models to bring that to bear. Um, over the last 18 months or so, we've been able to evolve better into five distinct product categories. We're, for lack of a better term, we're a matchmaker. Uh, we aren't the financer ourselves, but we've got a stable of financers that we can bring to projects. We only focus on large scale projects because that's where we believe the economies of scale for the deep green retrofits make the, the most sense and where there's the best bang for the buck in terms of high efficiency. We also have a growing stable of, of qualified architects, engineers, designers, that if our clients don't have that acumen within their own <coughs> organizations, we can bring that to bear as well. We are passionate about carbon and believe that there needs to be some way of monetizing the carbon benefits of all of this work. So we do have that as a component. We realize there are lots of challenges with doing that. But it is a, uh, a foundational sort of uh, focus of ours. The expertise network is a little uh, enigmatic. It's where we do a lot of community outreach. Uh, we were fortunate enough to work down in New York post Sandy with the New York City Bar Association's Task Force on Climate Change and uh, Pratt Institute to put on a financing summit specifically geared towards financing an equitable and resilient future. The last and, quite frankly, almost the most important, not that energy and water isn't important together, but we believe that uh, buildings need to be addressing water as well as energy. And we're fortunate to be partnered with uh, John Todd Ecological Design. John Todd is a professor emeritus from UVM and, and a pioneer in, in wastewater remediation. <coughs> If you go to enough Passive House conferences, there's a lot of talk about Passive House being a team sport, that it requires the orchestration of a lot of different groups to really deliver <coughs> the type of building that the client is asking for. What I've seen is that Passive House is really much more like an ecosystem. If you look down at New York, it's got training, you have designers, you've got suppliers, all working in concert together. And that type of ecosystem is what we're hoping to start building here in the, the south end of Burlington. We're starting with baby steps. We're doing a couple of training courses, uh, the Certified Passive House Consultant course, as well as a trade person training course to really start to get the, the ball rolling. We're a huge proponent of a, a building innovation center that we believe should be located here in the, the south end of Burlington. And we hope that the plan BTV process will allow us to, in a more formal way, advocate for that type of, of uh, center to really support the, the movement and the ecosystem. 
We've reached out to uh, the Vermont Woodworking School as well as Resource to start coordinating efforts. We all have very similar missions and we want to be able to work together in a, in a single, uh, very focused space here on, on Pine Street. The Passive House Academy is the uh, trainers uh, that are from New York that travel all over uh, the United States bringing a very high level of uh, coursework uh, to, the, to these programs. So the first time I met Gunter Lang was in 2013 at Passive House International. And Gunter was running around shepherding a very large contingent of uh, Chinese architects and developers that were thinking of integrating Passive House into their developments. And it's just a, it was a, such a glimmer of, of who and what uh, Gunter is. He is an ambassador to the, to the movement. He travels the world. Uh, sharing the knowledge that he's accumulated doing many, many projects in Europe. And it's, it's a pleasure to have a room filled here in Burlington, Vermont, and being able to, to host Gunter. So let's give Gunter a big Vermont <laughs> better have done a good job that so much people are coming have interest for this very uh, important uh, point of, of our life and uh, let's start not with me let's start with you I want to ask uh, you and I hope I hear your vote uh, who know a little bit what is a passive house please show me Okay, so you will fix it, yeah. <laughs> and I have a second question. Who of you want a better life? <laughs> okay. <laughs> then it's clear, then we can go to see there. <laughs> and, and finish, uh, I can finish my presentation directly yet. Uh, because I think that's one of the biggest solutions uh, to have a better life for your own, for your children, for everyone. And, uh, Maybe someone think, uh, thinking we have now also a very well life, but uh, maybe we, we can change it a little bit better than, than now. So I hope I make it right as you. That was my final. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> let's start with the situation today. And you see on the uh, left side the situation from now. Uh, such a uh, multi-family house need around 150 uh, parallel oil per year to, to, to heat this multi-family house. Uh, but this is in, in Vorarlberg. The, the climate, I have to say, is uh, nearly the same as, as here in Burlington. So we can dis discuss on the same level uh, what, what, <coughs> what we need. Uh, and that was the first retrofit two passive house standard in Vorarlberg and you see afterward they <coughs> can need only 10 liter of barrel oil but they don't need any longer any oil because they can change them on a very simple way to 100% renewable energies and that shall be the second solution uh, the energy revolution to 100% renewables and I'm very happy that I have heard before that Burlington have 100% renewable energy, so <laughs> <laughs> congratulations to you. And that it can be 100% whole in the future, we need now a big step forward in the energy efficiency, so to bring down our energy demand by 90% lower <coughs> than as now, and that's really, impos uh, really possible, <laughs> not impossible, as much people uh, are thinking uh, normally. But let's make a big step uh, to the past. If we look 800,000 years back, and we, we can look longer back, but uh, over the last 800,000 years, there exist now um, the statistics from, from the science, uh, from the ice drilling, uh, where they have controlled the CO2 concentration on one side 
and you can see here uh, on one side the temperature, on the other side the CO2 level. And when you see the CO2 level was always between 180 and 280 ppm in the atmosphere and it's changed from big uh, changing in, 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 in the atmosphere or from, from the continents and so on or from the planets. Uh, so climate change ch happened always and you can see that the CO2, uh, the temperature changed in the same time when the CO2 would change. So there is a directly connection between CO2 and temperature. But since, let me say, since George Bush was born on this planet, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the CO2 level rise up extremely. And I remember the, the video from Al Gore who was, uh, he, he was throwing up seven meters with, with the uh, elevator. I want to spring up, but I couldn't reach this 400 ppm where we are standing now. So only in these 60 years we have doubled this change of, of CO2 from the nature situation. And so I think every one of us can understand that this is not very well what we do in the moment and that it's go on any longer. And in the same time, the temperature have also going up and it will go up in the end of this century, uh, hopefully only two degrees. But in the moment, by the business, business as usual, we are by 6.4 degrees or maybe more. And that will be not the end of the way because change will not be from one day to the other stop. It, it's a long way and a long process. And so why by the United Nations yesterday or yesterday before they are sitting together, I don't think that the result come out, but the result have to become from our all, from everyone. Everybody is, is a part of, of climate change and we have it in our hand to change it to a better way. So the European Commission has signed uh, the, the roadmap for a lower CO2 economic by 2015 uh, because also the United Nations, the IPCC, have shown that by 2050 uh, all, the, all over the globe we have to, uh, to reduce our energy demand, uh, CO2 emission by 50% and the industry countries Europe as well, I hope uh, US is also an industry country, so that can be a, <laughs> a, a analyze if US is really an industry country, if you are willing to reduce your energy <laughs> demand by 90% uh, by end of uh, 2050. So for the building sector, that means that by uh, 2030, we have to reduce our CO2 emission by around 50% and by 2050, uh, a little bit more than 90%. Uh, and from this is coming then the uh, European <coughs> Building Directive uh, in 2010 uh, where they said all new buildings with the 1st of January 2021 and uh, all public buildings up to, uh, from uh, the 1st January 2019 have to be built as nearly zero energy building. So what is a nearly zero energy building? I know politicians are, definitions are very flexible and we have 28 countries and each country can have, have his own definition. But if you want it only to build it in a very economic way, then it's clear you have to build it in passive house standards. That's the most economic way, and I will show you later, uh, that it's real built in, in this economic way. Uh, so there are other solutions as well. Yeah, you can put on hundreds of square meters or, the, or square foot of, of PV only and build a worst standard building. Yeah? But then you need three or four times more floor spare space as your building is, and I think uh, maybe you, here you have the space, but normally in New York or otherwise it's impossible. So the most important point is the energy efficiency. And then the minimum of the rest energy you need any longer uh, have to be produced 100% by renewable energy and it has to be produced on the, your own ground floor from your own building. 
And if you think to, to the skyscrapers in, in New York or somewhere else as well in Vienna, uh, then it's really hard to realize this goal because you have many storage and uh, then to produce the energy it's very hard, but it's possible. That we will see it. By retrofits, there the goals are uh, also very strong. Uh, we have to build also uh, totally retrofits, also nearly to passive house standards. So in, in percent, you can say around 20% higher than the passive house standard themselves. So what is a passive house? Uh, I think it's as easiest to see <coughs> if you have a look on the energy demand. You see here the old building stock, uh, only that the red one is heating, the blue is hot water, and the yellow is the household electricity you need. Uh, so in our region, in our climate zone, the heating uh, needs are the, 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 the most important point. In, in south uh, regions, uh, as Florida or Jakarta in Indonesia, you have the cooling and humidity, but here the heating. Uh, by around uh, 70 kilopd juice per square foot and year, uh, the energy star regulation is by around uh, uh, 20 kilopd juice. Please correct me if I say something wrong. Uh, and when you have a look to the passive house standard, it goes much, much more lower to uh, 15 kilowatt hour per square meter or to 4.75 kilopd juice per square foot and year. And overall, including, and you can see that the heating becomes not the most important part. So the most important part is then the uh, energy consumption from the household electricity, but therefore uh, it's much more complicated because you cannot control what the owner will do, which uh, electric systems, they, they use computers and so on and everything and games. <laughs> uh, but uh, the hope is that there will come also a big change. When you remember less than 20 years, the computers need 100 watt. Now you have uh, computers with one watt also possible. Yeah? So there comes also uh, the LED and so on. So in summary, all together need 42 kilowatt hour per square meter or um, around uh, 13 kilopd juice per square meter. And while in US less than 0.1% of the new building uh, will be built in this uh, passive house standard in Austria and other, some other uh, European countries, we are now at 25% of all new buildings. So that shows it's possible. You only have to do it and become often this afternoon back to do it. Uh, have a first look uh, about the general building. Uh, it's the most important thing is not to have uh, make a strip piece with your house. Uh, please take a good jacket to the uh, building <laughs> around. Uh, and this is the first important point. Yeah? Uh, then it's warm <laughs> inside the house. Uh, you have to be careful then to have all the heat breaches. You normally forget to have to control it. <laughs> Uh, you have to look for the air tightness. The windows are triple glazing uh, and as well the frames are very well done. And then the windows bring in more energy than they lose. Normally the windows we have today are the hugest uh, energy loses, but now the windows are energy producers. So the windows are the most important uh, passive solar energy more important than thermal solar collectors or PV. So <laughs> it's the energy resources themselves. And when you have done this all well, <coughs> the next important point is uh, to become fresh air. Uh, and normally, uh, not so often, in, in US you have many uh, ventilation systems, but not ventilation system as we understand. You have this, uh, let's say crazy, uh, air conditioning <laughs> systems, uh, and I hope my, my voice uh, is coming also to the end uh, in correct way because when I stay some days in, in US, uh, I get <laughs> sick normally. Uh, so uh, 
normally we open the windows to become fresh air in, but then we lose uh, the, the heat inside the house. Uh, and so the solution is to make a controlled ventilation system uh, where the fresh air come in from outside. There are two options. Uh, one, I show you only one option. Go into the earth in, in a pipe with 20 centimeters, so uh, uh, dot, dot seven uh, feet. Eight inches. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, in, in two meters deepness, uh, if it has eight degrees plus, so how much is it in Fahrenheit? It's so complicated, everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 16. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and so in the winter time, uh, the, the air heat up. In summertime, the air can cool down uh, for free. And then it comes into the house. Here is the heat exchanger <laughs> from the old air, from the base, bathroom, the kitchen, and the toilet. Uh, the old air goes out, and before it goes out, by the heat exchanger, it gives the, the heat to, to the fresh air, heat up, and this go to the uh, living room, the sleeping room, or office rooms. So you have all time fresh air. And how, how smart such a solution can be, you see here. This is the whole technical, house technical center for a single family house. Let me tell me, uh, I say always, my house technical center is shit because it is placed in the toilet. So you don't need more space. And when you think on your single family houses, normally you have a huge place for, for all these uh, mecha mechanical systems and, and to storage the energy and so on. And that costs also much money. And that you can save to build a better building themselves.